So today we're going to be talking about one of the earliest vampire tales in the English language. Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla um, is neither the first nor the most famous vampire tale in England, but it exemplifies a number of 19th century anxieties that are important to understanding both the Gothic and its weird successors. So let's start by talking a little bit about the book that Carmilla is a part of and the 19th century discourses in which it operates. This is Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, Anglo-Irish newspaper editor and horror story writer. So Carmilla first appears in serial form in a magazine called The Dark Blue uh, over the course of a few months from 1871 to 1872. So what you're reading was not initially presented as a single unified narrative. It's a series of chapters that appear over time in a magazine. It's included as the final piece in Le Fanu's anthology in a glass darkly um, in 1872. Now the stories in In a Glass Darkly are all linked together by a frame narrative. Now the frame narrative was invented to provide some sort of unity to a group of stories that were composed at different times and initially had no relationship to each other. So it gives, in a glass darkly, the feel of a, kind of, um, a series of vignettes that are connected by a kind of tenuous logic. But we have to remember that that logic is um, a kind of back formation. It's right? something that Le Fanu imposed on the text later on. So, In a Glass Darkly purports to be the papers of an occult investigator by the name of Dr. Martin Hesalius, which had been organized after Hesalius' death by his secretary and confidant. And it's typical of late 19th century Gothic in that Hesalius uses science and pseudoscience in order to probe the mysteries of both the material and the spiritual worlds, right? In most of these texts, the spiritual world is intruding in some way upon the material world. And Hesalius uses scientific techniques, observational techniques, the scientific method to get to the bottom of what's going on. Now, one interesting thing about Carmilla, and uh, we'll get to this, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit further, right, in a bit. Carmilla doesn't quite fit into the Hesalius frame, or it fits less easily into the frame than the other tales do. And part of this is because Hesalius is not directly involved in any way in this particular case. And Laura, the narrator, um, often sounds as though she's talking to another woman. So it's never made quite clear how Hesalius got this information or who Laura is actually talking to. So it's kind of the odd tale out in the bunch. It's the one that uh, Le Fanu works probably the least hard to fit into the Hesalius framework. Now, there was a kind of vogue for vampire fiction in 19th century England, and it followed three basic trend lines. Right here we have an illustration from an edition of Samuel Taylor Coleridge's unfinished poem, Christabel. It's really with the Romantics 
that the vampire enters into English fiction, English lore, English poetry. So the first strain of vampire tale that we see arise in 19th century England is what we call the aristocratic vampire. So two good examples of this uh, would be the revenant figure in Lord Byron's poem, The Gavor. Um, Gavor is a Turkish word that means something like a foreigner. And it focuses on um, sort of a cursed aristocrat who uh, is you know, doomed to wander the earth for all time. Now Byron himself provides the model for the vampire character in John Polidori's very creatively titled novel, The Vampire, um, published in 1819. Polidori had been Byron's personal physician, um, and they'd had a falling out. And so Polidori gives Lord Ruthven, his vampire, much of Byron's sort of stormy, tempestuous personality. There is also the femme fatale vampire. The femme fatale is not just fatal in these works to men. She is also potentially fatal to other women, particularly motherless girls, as we see in Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem, Christabel, in which uh, the title character meets a sinister young woman named Geraldine in the woods, brings her home, and the, inc the implication, which is never quite pulled out because, like a lot of his works, Coleridge never finished the damn thing, um, is that Geraldine is sort of sucking the life energy out of Christabel over time. Uh, John Keats's 1819 poem, uh, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, um, in which a knight is lured into a grotto by a beautiful woman. Um, who then sort of steals his life force as she, does, as she has done with others in the past, also fits this particular pattern. And finally, we have the folkloric vampire. We don't really see too much of the folkloric vampire in this early vamp uh, vampire fiction, um, and I think some of this is because English writers tended to align the vampire generally with aristocratic figures. Right? The vampire in Eastern Europe, where the myth first arises, um, is a peasant sort of figure who comes back to plague his or her living relatives. You know, appears to them in dreams, can take animal forms, um, has, is bound by a number of different restrictions, like can't enter a house uninvited, um, if you throw seeds or grains of rice in front of them, they're forced to sort of sit and stop and count them out. This actually, by the way, is where uh, the idea for the Sesame Street character, the Count, comes from, like the sort of obsessive, compulsive um, attitude of the folkloric vampire, right? If you throw something in front of them, they have to sit down and count it. Uh, can't cross running water, things of that nature. Now, one of the interesting things about Carmilla as a novella is that this particular, the vampire character combines characteristics of all three. She's an aristocrat. She is a femme fatale with distinctly sort of same-sex attractions, right? She only preys on other women. And she is bound by some of these folkloric structures. Right? It seems that she has to be invited in. Um, she preys primarily on the peasant population, um, and so on and so forth. Now, we talked about the idea of the femme fatale vampire briefly um, as a kind of dark mother figure. And we can see Carmela behaving at times in this way for the motherless Laura. To my surprise, I saw a solemn but very pretty face looking at me from the side of the bed. 
It was that of a young lady who was kneeling with her hands under the coverlet. I looked at her with a kind of pleased wonder and ceased whimpering. She caressed me with her hands and lay down beside me on the bed and drew me towards her, smiling. I felt immediately and delightfully soothed and fell asleep again. I was awakened by a sensation as if two needles ran into my breast very deep at the same moment, and I cried loudly. So this is Laura's first encounter with the vampire, which occurs in early childhood, but after she has lost her mother, right? This potential mother figure appears in her nursery, smiles at her, climbs into bed with her, right? They snuggle like mother and child, and then the weird thing happens, right? This kind of role reversal here. Instead of the child feeding at the mother's breasts, the substitute mother feeds from the child's breast, right? As if two needles ran into my breast very deep. Now later on we see that in fact, Carmilla, who is really Mircalla Countess, Countess Karnstein, who died sometime in the late 17th century, is in fact a maternal relative of Loris, right? I am descended from the Karnsteins, that is, Mama was. So yeah, she is matrilinearly, matrilinearly related to Carmilla. And finally, when she sees Car the night that she sees Carmilla standing at the foot of her bed covered in blood, right? This should remind you, perhaps, of Lady Madeline's appearance in The Fall of the House of Usher at the end of that story. One night, instead of the voice I was accustomed to hear in the dark, I heard one, sweet and tender, and at the same time terrible, which said, your mother warns you to beware the assassin. At the same time, a light unexpectedly sprang up, and I saw Carmilla standing near the foot of the bed, standing at the foot of my bed in her white nightdress, bathed from her chin to her feet in one great stain of blood. So we have here something like the dead mother battling with the undead mother over the daughter figure. There's probably some sort of sexual connotation as well to the white nightdress covered with blood, as Carmilla does seem to be initiating Laura into some kind of sexual relationship, but I'll leave that to you to think about. And here we have an illustration um, of that scene from a 19th century edition of the novella. Now, to stay on that theme of sexual attraction in Carmilla, that's one of the things that is most noteworthy about this text, and one of the things that has attracted the most critical attention. Now, when Laura and Carmilla meet, Carmilla behaves as though this is some sort of predestined meeting, right? And she shares a memory that is very similar to the dream that Laura had of the vampire when she was six. Right. Looking up, while I was still on my knees, I saw you, most assuredly you, as I see you now. A beautiful young lady with golden hair and large blue eyes and lips. Your lips, you as you are here. Your looks won me. I climbed on the bed and put my arms around you, and I think we both fell asleep. I was aroused by a scream. Now. There are a couple of key points here to note. First, Carmilla does not speak of Laura as a child here, right? She speaks of her as a fully grown adult woman and focuses in particular on Laura's lips, which are not only a site of sexual attraction, but are also the site from which the vampire feeds, right? The vampire bites its victims. Finally, the fact she says she was aroused by a scream 
Sexually aroused? Yeah, probably. And Carmilla does a lot of things to Laura that make Laura a little bit uncomfortable. She used to place her pretty arms about my neck, draw me to her, and laying her cheek to mine, murmur with her lips near my ear, Dearest, your little heart is wounded. In the rapture of my enormous humiliation, I live in your warm life, and you shall die, die sweetly die, into mine. Now, if you are trying to convince someone to date you, this is probably not the language you should be using. But <clears throat> it seems here that Carmilla is trying to make Laura into whatever she is, right? That her attraction to Laura is in part based on some sort of recognition that Laura is in some way, a potential future Carmilla, right? You shall die, sweetly die, into mine, into my undeath, into my eternal, not quite life, and we'll be together always. Sometimes, after an hour of apathy, my strange and beautiful companion would take my hand and hold it with a fond pressure, renewed again and again, blushing softly, gazing in my face with languid and burning eyes, and breathing so fast that her dress rose and fell with a tumultuous respiration. It was like the ardor of a lover. It embarrassed me. It was hateful and yet overpowering. And with gloating eyes she drew me to her, and her hot lips traveled all along my cheek in kisses, and she would whisper, almost in sobs, you are mine, you shall be mine, you and I are one forever. Then she has thrown herself back in her chair with her small hands over her eyes, leaving me trembling. Right. <clears throat> there is no way in which Carmela's attraction to Laura is not, on some level, sexual. And to an extent, even though she's made uncomfortable by it, right, Laura returns Carmela's affection, right? As much as this embarrasses her, right, she continues to seek out Carmilla's company. She continues, even after she gains some sort of inkling of what Carmilla really is, to be concerned about her friend. We see them here sitting together, watching the funeral of the peasant girl go by. Now, when we talk about the uncanny in this text, right? Carmilla both attracts and repulses Laura, right? She is human and something else. She is familiar and alien. She is herself an uncanny figure. We have some images here from a, uh, a comic strip version of the text. Now, whatever embarrassment Laura feels, right, she does feel drawn to this figure, right? And the truth is, I felt rather unaccountable towards the beautiful stranger. I did feel, as she said, drawn towards her, but there was also something of repulsion, right? The very definition of the uncanny. In this ambiguous feeling, however, the sense of attraction immensely prevailed. She was interested in one me. She was so beautiful and so indescribably engaging. Are we related, I used to ask. What can you mean by all this? I remind you perhaps of someone whom you love, but you must not, I hate it. I don't know you, I don't know myself when you look so and talk so. Right, this is indicative of that kind of love-hate relationship that Laura has with Carmilla. Carmilla both draws her in and makes her profoundly uncomfortable. Now, all of the stories in In a Glass Darkly 
are in some way concerned with this tension between the material world and the spiritual world. And Carmilla is no exception. So first, to deal with the spiritual. At one point, Laura's father says, we are in God's hands. Nothing can happen without his permission. And all will end well for those who love him. He is our faithful creator. He has made us all and will take care of us. The materialist viewpoint is expressed by Carmilla. Creator, nature, said the young lady, in answer to my gentle father. And this disease that invades the country is natural. All things proceed from nature, don't they? All things in the heaven, in the earth, and under the earth act and live as nature ordains? I think so. So a couple of things to note here. One, that the spiritual language here is the province of the male character. It's often the other way around, right? We often associate female figures with spirituality and male figures with rationality and materialism. But here, the father says everything's in God's hands, right? And it's pointing to a transcendent world. Whereas it's Carmilla, who is herself a supernatural monster, arguing for nature and materialism, right? In a way, she seems to be trying here to justify her own material existence as natural, right? Yes, I'm a vampire. Of course, she doesn't go so far as to say that, right? Yes, I'm a vampire, but I am only obeying natural impulses in this particular form, right? If I exist, nature must have made me, and nature must have made me this way. So in a way, this seems to be an attempt to draw our sympathies towards the vampire figure here, right? If I am like this, it is because nature has made me so. If I exist, it is because nature permits me to exist. I fulfill some sort of natural function. Now, <clears throat> Just as the father trumpets the supremacy of God, while Carmilla argues from nature, the climax of the story is a reassertion of patriarchal control. Right? Carmilla has come in and upset at least two male-dominated households. Right? that of Laura's father, and that of the general, whose niece she has killed. So, the general and Laura's father go together with their party into the Karnstein Chapel, and together they destroy the vampire. The next day, the formal proceedings took place in the chapel of Karnstein. The grave of the Countess Mercala was opened, and the general and my father recognized each his perfidious and beautiful guest in the face now disclosed to view. The features, though 150 years had passed since her funeral, were tinted with the warmth of life. Her eyes were open. No cadaverous smell exhaled from the coffin. The two medical men one officially present, the other on the part of the promoter of the inquiry, attested the marvelous fact that there was a faint but appreciable respiration and a corresponding action of the heart. The limbs were perfectly flexible, the flesh elastic, and the leaden coffin floated with blood in which to a depth of seven inches the body lay immersed. Here, then, were all the admitted signs and proofs of vampirism. The body, therefore, in accordance with the ancient practice, was raised, and a sharp stake driven through the heart of the vampire, who uttered a piercing shriek at the moment, in all respects such as might escape from a living person in the last agony. Then the head was struck off, and a torrent of blood flowed from the severed neck. The body and head 
were next placed on a pile of wood and reduced to ashes, which were thrown upon the river and borne away, and this territory has never since been plagued by the visits of a vampire. So, I probably don't have to draw out for you the phallic implications of the stake and you know, the idea of sort of a masculine violation of a woman's body that occurs in staking the vampire. The beheading is a little bit stranger. Now, on the one hand, that's part of the traditional folkloric means of killing a vampire, right? You stake the vampire to the ground first so they can't get away. Then you cut off the head and burn the body in order to fully destroy the creature. But in this case, too, Carmilla is a female vampire who has in many ways usurped the position of men, right? She's replaced Carmilla's father, in his, or she's replaced Laura's father in the girl's affections, right? She wormed her way into the general's household, and she has taken the place of a male lover. You know, um, at various points, Laura talks about the possibility that Carmilla is in fact a boy in disguise who has wormed her way into the castle, right? So the beheading may also be a kind of symbolic castration. Now the other thing to note here is the very dry, formal, official language here. And the two medical men are officially present to record the event, right? And they record it in a way that is very, very clinical and scientific and rational. And it is very, very far from the kind of dreamy love language that Carmilla has used with Laura. And that is very far from Laura's own encounters with the vampires, right? She doesn't talk at all about flexible limbs or elastic flesh or faint but appreciable respiration, right? This is not Laura's language. This is the language of official inquiry, the language of government and of law and of medicine. So it's an attempt to contain a chaotic feminine discourse within a rational, official, legal male discourse. Now, even after this reassertion of patriarchal power, though, the story leaves open several loose ends. First, what has become of Carmilla's supposed mother and their entourage? Right? After the carriage accident, we never see them again. So where are they and what are they doing? Secondly, we need to think about to what extent Carmilla really is a natural creature, as she seems so keen to argue. It's to a Victorian audience, most of her proclivities, you know, her behavior of feeding on the blood of others, and her lesbianism would seem unnatural. Why is she so keen to argue that she is, in fact, natural? And why does Le Fanu give her the space in which to do so? And finally, right, we don't know who the auditor is here. We don't know who Laura is speaking to. But her final words to that auditor are also particularly interesting. The following spring, my father took me a tour through Italy. We remained away for more than a year. It was long before the terror of recent events subsided, and to this hour, the image of Carmilla returns to memory with ambiguous alternations. Sometimes the playful, languid, beautiful girl, sometimes the writhing fiend I saw in the ruined church, and often, from a reverie I have started, fancying I heard the light step of Carmilla 
at the drawing room door. So whatever else has happened to Carmilla, right? She lives on in Laura's memory. And not just her horrific death, her destruction at the hands of the father, the general, and the doctors, but also the time that they spent together as, you know, really sort of girlish lovers. Now, there are also some critics who leave open the possibility that Laura herself has become a vampire and is continuing Carmela's depriva depriva uh, depredations. I'm not sure there's really enough evidence for that. But it is clear here that the attempt to shut the vampire down is not entirely successful. Right. Carmilla has gotten into Laura's head. And it's not going to be, it's not easy to get her out. So that's about it for Carmilla. Um, we're going to be reading a decadent fairy tale by Oscar Wilde for next time. Um, the Fisherman and His Soul. So I want you to think about the following as you read. First, we talked about um, mater the material and the spiritual here and sort of divide between them. Um, I want you to think about how this works in The Fisherman and His Soul, right? So what that the tale treats soul and body as separable objects? What do you think wild means for the soul to represent here? Secondly, why does the fisherman keep saying that love is best, right? Why does he seem to elevate romantic sexual love over other values? And does the story seem to endorse this particular point of view, right? That love is always best. Third, what do you make of the question that the witch asks the fisherman repeatedly when he first comes to see her? Is there anything ironic about it, right? There'll be a question that the witch is just going to repeat over and over again. Read it carefully, I want you to think about it. And finally, why does the priest change his mind about the creatures of sea and field and forest at the end of the story? And how is his attitude towards the world outside of his cloister changed and why? All right, so that'll do it for this time. Um, next lecture will be on Oscar Wilde. We'll see you then.